everyone. This is Shannon, and I am here. I'm ready to start John chapter three. I'm super excited. Um, thank you all for being so flexible with your schedules. Um, I know that this time is um, good for this week because my little one gets out of school in about an hour, and then I will get with everybody um, ne for next week. As far as next week, because school's out, I may try to do it at night. Um, so I'm hoping that that may be actually better for some of y'all that do have to work. Hey, Crystal, I'm so glad you are joining me. Um, so yeah, so just stay tuned and make sure you go on um, Passionate Penny Pincher Facebook Savings Group. Um, and if you are on YouTube and watching this, um, and then probably go on by Tuesday, I would say, and just check and see what time I'm going to do the study next week. Because next week I have a pretty insane week. Um, but I'm really hoping that I'll be able to do it because the next week I will not be able to do Bible study that week. So um, just a little bit of housekeeping there I wanted to get into before we jump into the lesson. Um, and so definitely um, make sure that you come back on probably Monday or Tuesday on the savings group and I'll have more of a time. And most likely it'll be at night. I actually asked my hubby last night what night is good for us that we'll be consistently home and everything. So we forgot to finish our conversation because <laughs> I got busy probably. <laughs> um, so I am so excited about um, John chapter three, but y'all, I am totally, um, I want to say that I'm not adequate at all to teach this. And as I say that, I really am not. I, I am not equipped and I am so grateful for the Holy Spirit. That's all I can say. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and start in a word of prayer. Lord, we just thank you so much for this beautiful day um, that you have blessed us with. Um, and we just thank you that you are the one that gives us breath, that you are the one that gives us life, Lord, and that we're able to live in a country that we can come and worship you freely, and we can come and have this Bible study, which is so crazy that um, people from all over get to um, to watch and learn more about your word. I pray, Lord, that you will just totally guide me and direct me onto what you want me to say, Lord. Um, Lord, we just thank you for your word. We thank you that we have it to learn more about you and to come closer to you in it. And I thank you for every single person um, just being a part of this, Lord. I'm just so grateful for them and their hearts and their desire to really um, learn more about you, Lord. And I just ask that you will um, grow us closer to you as we dig into John chapter 3. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, y'all. Um, hey, Stacy, I'm so glad you are have joined us. Um, okay, as I said, after this quote, you are going to see why I say I do not, I am not worthy to teach this at all. This is by um, Charles Spurgeon, who I absolutely love him. And he says, if we were asked to read it to a dying man who did not know the gospel, we should probably select this chapter as the most suitable one for such an occasion. And what is good for dying men is, is good for us all, for that is what we are. And how soon we may be actually at the gates of death, none of us can tell. Wow. So starting that, when I read that, when I just started like doing the... Um, just doing the like starting of this, I was like, wow, there's no pressure, <laughs> no pressure at all. <laughs> but this is such a rich chapter. And as I was reading it, I just couldn't, I, we we're definitely going to break it up into two parts. And I'm, what I'm hopeful is to get to verse 15 is, and just stop at John 3, 16. I just couldn't, I couldn't with the time I had, like, I usually have four pages of notes and I had five today. So I knew I just didn't want to rush through John 3, 16, of course. Um, so hopefully the airplane will be too loud. Verse 1, we're going to go ahead and dive in. There was a man from the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. Okay, so Nicodemus is a ruler of the Jews. Um, he was one of those impressed by Jesus' signs. So if you go back to John 2, 23, which we talked about, um, and he was a member, we talked about last week, and he was a member of the ruling Sanhedrin. He was, a relig he was religious, which is the Pharisee. So if you ever see Pharisees in John or any of the Gospels or throughout the whole New Testament, you have to remember that the Pharisees are very educated. They're very influential and earnest enough to come by. And he was, but Nicodemus was earnest enough to come by night. Um, some say that maybe he came at night so no one would see him. We don't really know Nicodemus's heart and why he, he is doing, why he came at night. But um, he came to Jesus as a representation of all men. And that was John, if you go back to John 2, 23 through 25. And in a sense, he represented what is the highest and best in men. But Nicodemus is a Pharisee. So if you turn to John chapter 18, we're going to read 9 through 14. So I didn't write this in my notes. I'm going to flip over there. 
and it says, so because we always have to know our audience. So whenever we're reading scripture, we always need to know who our audience is. That's so important to know, um, especially for me, because it really is a game changer if we always know our audience and we have to know who Jesus is talking to, especially in his parables and all of that. We'll talk about that more when we get further into John, but we always need to know. That's why we're going to talk a lot about Nicodemus today, but it's so vital that we know what a Pharisee is. Um, and so 18, 9 through 14, um, this was, okay, I have the, I must have the wrong, y'all, I must have the wrong scripture. I probably, you know what, I think that was Matthew. I think we're going to get back into this. Sorry, y'all, I feel so ill-equipped Ill for that, but I think we're going to get back into that. Um, so scratch that. We're probably going to get back into that later on in the chapter, but I'm pretty sure that was Matthew that we're supposed to go to. Um, so, yeah, I'm most positive it is. Let me go to Matthew. I think I put John, but it was Matthew 18. Because we have to, like, this is so vital. I'm so sorry, y'all. Usually I just write down the scripture. Um, nope. Okay, sorry. I usually write down the scripture, and this time I didn't. So, um, verse 2, we'll just go ahead and skip to that, and hopefully we'll get back to that. Um, this man came to him at night and said, Rabbi, we know that you have come from God as a teacher, for no one can perform these signs you do unless God were with him. Coming from a teacher of Israel, and that's um, we'll go into that in 310, the, ad the address Rabbi denotes respect, especially since it was known that Jesus did not have formal um, rabbi rabbinic <laughs> training so you have to remember jesus didn't go he wasn't he didn't go to the rabbi training remember when he was 12 he went and he would like whenever mary and joseph lost him and then he was there teaching at the temple and everything but he now the rabbis then they were raised pretty much that's their lineage and that's how they were raised they were raised to be a rabbi and so um that's what was so like so if you see that that's where he's coming from but even though Nicodemus sees that, he still has respect for Jesus, which says a lot about Nicodemus. And we'll see why that says so much more as we go more about the Pharisees and talk more about them. The signs mentioned in John's gospel presumably included those performed in Jerusalem, possibly the temple clearing. And we talked about that last week. No one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. We understand the sense in which Nicodemus meant this, but his statement was not entirely true. The Bible tells us that deceivers and false prophets can sometimes perform remarkable signs. So I said um, on the thing, I hope you all got some paper and pen. I'm going to really cross-reference a lot of scripture, but because I have so much information today, I hope you all can go back and maybe your quiet time or some spare time. And there's a lot of people who say laugh at that, but <laughs> um, if you have some spare time, um, go back and look at some of these scriptures because I'm going to just, uh, there, I just knew I didn't have enough time. So I'm just going to throw some out there and you can go back and read them. So that's from 2 Thessalonians 2, 9, and then Revelation 13, 13 through 14. So verse 3, it says, Jesus replied, I assure you, unless someone is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Okay, so Jesus said this. That is huge, y'all. I mean, that is just huge. You have to remember the time when he, he, was, he was talking to Nicodemus on this. It was taught widely among the Jews at that time that since they descended from Abraham, they were automatically assured of heaven. Jesus is saying that for anyone to enter the kingdom of God, the realm of salvation, eternal life, forgiveness of sin, that person must be born from above, born again. This is the doctrine of regeneration. Y'all, this is a huge Christianese word. Um, it, so some of y'all who have not been raised in the church, which I was not raised in the church, um, I was kind of go a little of my background. I didn't really become a Christian until I was pregnant with my oldest, who is now 20. Um, I was I went to church here and there, and um, maybe after my parents' divorce, I went for a couple of years, but I was never really raised in a Christian home or any of that. I had strong Christian um, grandpa grandparents, but um, my mom is definitely a Christian, but she just never, I mean, she did what she could as a single mom, um, but it just, I was not raised that in, in that. Um, so I didn't know any of these terms. So when I became a Christian, so all of, all of y'all that were raised in the church and you know all of these things, it can kind of be overwhelming for people like me who wasn't, who, who just wasn't raised in the church and didn't know these things. And people are talking and you feel as if you don't know what they're talking about and you don't want to say anything because you really feel kind of like inadequate. So I always say, if you're a, if you've been a believer your whole life, praise the Lord. That is awesome. 
but also remember new believers don't know the words that we know and we always have to be cautious of that and um, always explain things I'm actually mentoring um, a girl right now and she's amazing but she was raised in China and so she has no idea what any of the words mean so we've been going through Matthew and she has no idea what the words mean so I have to kind of tell her okay this means this and she knows nothing which is amazing and I love it I love it because I get to explain to her who Abraham is and who Isaac is and everything so there's beauty in that but also remember as you're talking to people not everybody's going to know what these words are and regeneration is a huge word it is a huge word but it's huge as a Christian to know what regeneration is because we do need to know that but um and so that's why this is so cool that we get to learn what that is but also just be mindful whenever you're talking to people that they may not know what that is <laughs> and so we kind of have to explain it um and so as we go it says unless so verse three Okay, so I'm kind of going to go a little a bit of verse 3 through 8, but then I'm going to go back and kind of explain them more. But the discussion of the need for spiritual rebirth develops the reference to the children of God who are born of God and in the prologue. Um, sorry, the phrase born of water and the spirit probably refers to the spirit, spiritual birth that cleanses from the sin and brings spiritual transformation. The kingdom of God, a major topic in the other Gospels, is mentioned by John only in verses 3 and 5. So we're going to go ahead and kind of read those. It says, um, but how can anyone be born when he is old? Nicodemus asked them. Can he enter his mother's womb a second time and be born? Jesus answered, I assure you, unless someone is born of water and the spirit, he is born of the flesh. Is flesh and whatever is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not be amazed that I told you that you must be born again. The wind blows where it pleases, and you hear it sound, but you don't know where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. Okay, y'all, this is weird if you think about it. Think about someone in there. Think about what Jesus is saying. It is just weird. I mean, it just is. If you, it, it just is. So that's why it's really good to know these things. And because think about someone who was not, who has no idea what that means. And then they hear that. That's confusing. Um, and so it said, so that's why it's really good to kind of break it down and kind of understand it more. That way we can explain it to others as well. Um, so unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Jesus' reply to Nicodemus shattered the Jewish assumption that their racial identity, their old birth, assured them a place in God's kingdom. Jesus made it plain that a man's first birth does not assure him of the kingdom. Only being born again gives us the reassurance. So this is huge, y'all. It's just huge. Um, it's like Jesus is saying, um, game changer, everything you believe, it's wrong. That's what he's pretty much saying. Everything you think you are, you're not. I mean, he is totally kind of offending him by saying this. He's saying you are not guaranteed anything, buddy, just because you are Jewish. That is so hard for him because he's been, he's been, I mean, it's kind of like, the fame like actors and actresses now and like if they go somewhere everybody wants to get a picture of them and because they're just so famous and everything but they're no different than us right well nicodemus and the pharisees if they went anywhere people definitely respected them and they had to honor them they're you know and so people knew that they were the jewish leaders at that time and so um as he as jesus is saying this this is rocking nicodemus's world because he's so it's just, he's saying you must be born again, but that is not a command. It is a statement of fact. So Jesus is saying that as a fact, you have to be born again. It's not a choice. You have to, you know, um, and I absolutely love this quote. Nicodemus addressed Jesus as a rabbi and teacher. Jesus responded to him as the one who announced new life. Oh, that's pretty awesome. Um, our Lord replies, it is not learning, but life that is wanted for in the Messiah's kingdom and life must be must begin at by birth. So we as like so we see um, we talked to also about like having when we have children how that just oh it's just so powerful and everything because we all have been born. We've all been born. Um, rather it be you know your mom, you don't, but we all we all were born from somebody. And so we all ha know that, but it's hard to think we have to be born again. And that's what being a Christian is, is we're being born again. Um, so all over the New Testament, this idea of rebirth, recreation occurs. So here's where the scriptures going to come in. So y'all jot these down. 
First Peter speaks of being born anew by God's great mercy. That's in First Peter 1.3. 1 Peter speaks of being born anew from an imperishable seed. That's from 1 Peter 1, 22 through 23. James speaks of God bringing us forth by the word of truth. That's from James 1, 18. Titus speaks to us of the washing of regeneration. It's that big word. Um, Titus 3, 5. Romans speaks of dying with Jesus and rising anew. That's from Romans 6, 1 through 11. Romans is actually my favorite book in the Bible. So it's, ew, it's so deep. Um, 1 Corinthians speaks of new believers as newborn babes, and that's 1 Corinthians 3, 1 through 2. 2 Corinthians speaks of us being a new creation in Jesus, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Galatians says that in Jesus we are a new creation, Galatians 6, 15. Ephesians says that new men is created after God in righteousness, Ephesians 4, 22 through 23. And Hebrews says that at the beginning of our Christian life, we are like children, Hebrews 5, 12 through 14. So that's lots of scripture backing up this one verse. I always say scripture has to back up scripture with scripture, and this is tons of it. Um, we have to have life in the Holy Spirit first, then learning comes. I have mentioned this before, but we have to surrender to the Lord first. Y'all, so many people get this wrong. Um, we can't say, I will believe if or when, um, when my life gets on track, when I when I can get out of this relationship because people know that their relationship is not godly. Um, and so sometimes whenever we're in a bad, like harmful relationship, that's not um, honoring the Lord. So people know that and they think, well, if I come to know the Lord, I have to get out of this. And because I have to get out of it, I don't want to, I really like being in this. And, or I really like this sin that I'm in. I really, you know, I really, whatever you fill in the blank because everybody has something different. Um, and people it's like, it's, but you have to flip it. You have to flip that way of thinking. What we do is we say, okay, Lord, I am a sinner. I know I fail. I know I am not living a, a life that's honoring you, but I want to. So I'm going to surrender my life and live, as, live because you are Lord of my life. And that's whenever, whenever we do that, that's when we get the Holy Spirit. And whenever we get the Holy Spirit, that's when our new birth starts. And that's whenever we see, yeah, it may not come overnight. You know, I became a Christian. It took me a while for the struggles that I had and everything because I struggled with a lot of things from my childhood and everything that I had to deal with. Um, and so because of that, we have to see that we have to believe first. We cannot say, I'm going to figure it out first. And then I'm going to believe we have, because we can't, it's hard to understand if we're reading scripture without the Holy spirit, we're reading scripture with our own mind. And it's, if you know that there's people, if you know people in your life who are not believers and they challenge the Bible all the time, well, the thing is, is they're reading the Bible without the Holy Spirit. And without the Holy Spirit, y'all, we are nothing. <laughs> I could never teach this if it wasn't for the Holy Spirit. So we have to rely on the Holy Spirit to show us things. And that's why we, we really have to come to know the Lord um, and say, okay, I'm ready for you to be Lord of my life. Yeah, my life is a mess. I'm a hot mess and I just do not know what to do. But that's why going to church and being involved in a church and just having somebody that can come and disciple you and help you learn scripture and everything. Um, and then that's whenever scripture is what changes us. People do not. <laughs> and so that's what, that's why it's so important for the word of God to come into our lives and everything. Um, save by grace, faith. Works won't get us to heaven. We must have Jesus. Vicki, you are on it and you are with it because we are going to talk about that. So let's go to verse four. Um, had our Lord said, every Gentile must be born again. He would have understood. Um, so that is it's such an amazing statement. So what, what this is saying is if Jesus would have told Nicodemus, hey, Gentiles need to do that. Because remember, the Jewish are the, the chosen people. So they, they automat so Nicodemus automatically thought he's going to heaven because he's Jewish. But Gentiles were looked down upon. And um, so he's saying, like, Jesus said a game changer because he put, included the Jewish people with the Gentiles, which was unheard of then. Because Gentiles were definitely not like set up on bar, like the, the bar, like the um, Pharisees were and the, the Jewish people were. Um, so that to me is such a huge statement that if Jesus would have said that, if he would have just said that, Nicodemus would have been fine. Um, Nicodemus was reacting as any legalist would react. Say, are you kidding me? I've spent my entire life doing things to get into heaven. Now you're telling me the only way into the kingdom is by means of something that I have nothing to do with. Um, can you relate to this? Like, and so Vicki, that's what you just said. You said, um, I won't get it. Like, it's nothing that we, ha we can do. And so that was such a, that it was taking culture at a whole new way in a whole new level, because 
Nicodemus, it was all about the works. It was works, works, works. They had to do this. They had to do that. And by having that mentality, there's so many things that we really um, hurt ourselves by having that works mentality. It's kind of like this. The way I explain it to people is I say, um, yeah, it's not about works. But if you go into James, there has to be works whenever you have a relationship with God. Um, because it's like faith and works go together. So when we truly know the Lord, then we want to have, we want to do things to please the Lord, not because we have to, but because we want to. So there is nothing that we can do for our, for our salvation because Jesus already did that on the cross, but because of our salvation, we want to do things. And so it's, but see, Nicodemus doesn't see that. Nicodemus is like, no, everything I've done, it's because of me and everything. So it's like changing that thought process. And y'all, this is so hard for legalists, especially if people have been raised in a church where it's all about works. And, um, you know, there's things that people hold on to, like, you know, people will say the Sabbath has to be on Sunday, you can't work, or you can't do this, or you can't do that and, and everything. And, and that's like, it's this or nothing. And we have to be careful with that. We really have to be careful with that. Um, and that's why Nicodemus was so huge, you know, but this was so foreign to him. And description of new birth, Jesus recalls a familiar the Old Testament promises in the New Co Covenant. Y'all, I may have to go inside. My, I'm sweating. Um, so here's some more scripture to look at. Deuteronomy 30, one, 30 verses 1 through 6. Jeremiah 23, 1 through 8. Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34. Jeremiah 32, 37 through 41. Ezekiel 11, 16 through 20. Ezekiel 36, 16 through 28, Ezekiel 37, 11 through 14, and Ezekiel 37, 20 through 28. These passages, passages essentially made three promises in the new covenant. The gathering of Israel, the cleansing and spiritual transformation of God's people, the reign of the Messiah over Israel and the whole world. That's why Jesus' statement above the new birth was so strange to Nicodemus. He thought that the Jewish people already had it. They certainly weren't looking for it. They only looked for a triumphant Messiah. Remember, they thought the Messiah would come as a king, not as a carpenter. And this is why they are still waiting on the Messiah today. Like Jewish people do not believe that Jesus is the Messiah. And which is so sad to me because there's, if you look at just all of those scriptures, I just said, those all proclaim Jesus. Um, and there's a ton more in the Old Testament that proclaim Jesus. Um, so verses five through seven, this does not mean baptism by water like we would think. You have to remember that Jesus is talking to Nicodemus, who is a scholar of the Old Testament. Remember, we didn't have, they didn't have this in, in the Old Testament. So we kind of, I just mentioned Ezekiel, Ezekiel 36, um, 25, it says that, then I will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols. Moreover, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. There. There is their difference is the water and the spirit. The water and the spirit is simply a reference to the creation, the new creation, the regeneration work of God that he does. He does by his own in the heart of a sinner. And here he's promised one day to do it, not only in individual Jews and Gentiles, but one day for the whole nation of Israel. I will put a new heart in you, a new spirit in you. Remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart, heart of flesh. I'll put my spirit within you. You can also look in Jeremiah 24, 7 and 31, 31. So this is just backing up what Jesus is saying. Again, this was huge for, uh, for Nicodemus. Y'all have to, I mean, it's just so huge. So verse eight, and this is, I love this verse because a lot of people will say, well, how can you believe in Jesus? because you don't see him. I can't see him. I always go to this verse. This verse is the verse I go to because we can't see the wind. We can see the effects of wind, right? We can see, I mean, tornadoes are a perfect example of the effects of wind, right? But we can't see the wind. Um, Jesus, we can't, we may not be able to see him in, in person, but we sure do see the effects of him. I mean, look, we have, we're breathing. That's one but we have the trees, we have, I mean, the sunrise and the sunset. And like we mentioned, childbirth, we have just loving others um, because we're so prone to be selfish, right? But yet we love others. And so that's just another example of who Christ is. Um, and so this is, this is just so huge, y'all. It's just so huge. And so the wind is invisible. 
It is uncontrollable. It is irresistible. It is unpredictable. It cannot be summoned. It doesn't show up because you want it. It doesn't go away because you'd like to get rid of it. This is the second analogy that our Lord uses with this smart, sharp, clear thinking, logical rabbi to tell him that this is a work in which he doesn't participate. Jesus's idea to Nicodemus was you don't understand everything about the wind, but you see its effect. That is just how it is with the birth of the spirit. Jesus wanted Nicodemus to know that he didn't have to understand everything about the new birth before he experienced it. So this is just saying, Nicodemus, it's okay, buddy, if you don't understand everything I'm saying right now. You don't have to figure it all out. You have to have faith and trust. How many of y'all are at that place right now where there's something in your life that's going on and you just don't understand why or how it's happening? And why is there a God out there that really is allowing this to happen? And y'all, this that is so huge because a lot of us struggle with that. And it's not like if you become a Christian, you're just you're just good and you you have it all figured out. Um, I was kind of telling the story. I wasn't planning on telling this. Um, hopefully, I can have time. I'm trying to keep it with that 45 minutes. Um, I was actually telling one of the girls I, I mentor yesterday. I met her for lunch, and I was saying, you know, sometimes we go through things and we don't understand why and how, and but we have to have faith and trust. Um, and this is not going to be like in the grand scheme of life. I, this is not a huge deal, but it is to me because I love mission trips. I love going abroad. I love, love other countries and cultures. And one time I was actually going to Indonesia. And um, as I flew into Detroit, we had our missions um, director up on the announcements and saying, you know, for me and the girl who I was with to, um, to call him. And so we were like, oh, my goodness. Well, my husband actually was on another mission trip in Nepal. And so I was like, oh, my goodness. And so um, I thought something happened to him. And so I was kind of freaking out. Well, then when we picked up the phone, it ended up being that if we went into Indonesia, it was going to be really dangerous. Um, at that time, this was years ago. And I don't know if it was the country I was going to. <laughs> I don't know if I should have. But, um, and it was extremely dangerous because they had actually bombed the embassy, the U.S. embassy, um, two days before that. We thought we would be fine, but then they actually pulled to where Americans couldn't travel in that country um, at that time. So we had to turn around. And here, my heart was ready to be in Indonesia. My husband was gone in, in Nepal, and I was actually supposed to go with him to Nepal. But I, the day before they ordered planes, I really felt like God was calling me to go to Indonesia. So we planned that. And then here, I'm like, well, how is that fair, Lord? Like, he got to go on his mission trip, and here I am back, you know, back here. And, you know, I had planned. My heart was there. We, we prepared months in advance to go. And I didn't understand why. Um but I, and I probably, and I do understand now why, but at the time I didn't, um, I did end up getting to go, but it was months later and we actually had somebody else join us on the trip, which actually ended up being such a blessing. Um, I'm so directionally challenged. And if me and, um, my friend would have just went, it would have been so bad because we're both directionally challenged. So God was actually watching over us, but we didn't see that at the time. We were very much sad and heartbroken all week. We were just depressed and everything. So, um, that sometimes we don't understand why though and I don't completely understand why but I can see glimpses of God's protection for sure um and so that's that's why what Jesus is telling Nicodemus he's saying you don't have to understand why Nicodemus you have to have faith you have to trust and so that's what's so important to to see that in that scripture so if you're struggling with just doubt and not understanding verse 8 is just a really good verse to just cling to and um okay Verses 9 through 14. Don't you be asked, Nicodemus, are you a teacher of Israel and don't know these things? Jesus replied, I assure you, we speak what we know and we testify to what we have seen, but you do not accept our testimony. If I, if I have told you about these things, what happened on earth and you don't believe, how will you believe if I tell you about things on heaven? No one has ascended into heaven except the one who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And Nicodemus was confused. He was so set in his thinking that the new birth had already happened to him and all the faithful Israel that he had a hard time thinking differently. Jesus had to keep explaining how many, like, so he had to just keep on. So how many of us are in or have been like Nicodemus in our lives? Um, is there something that you just struggle with? And we kind of, I just kind of mentioned that, but just confused with. Um, and something that we hold on to, just thinking that it has to be this way or no way. Um, and I, you know, as I was reading this, I don't know why, but the, the word unforgiveness came to my mind. Um, sometimes we hold on to that hurt so
so much that we do not look, we, we don't think differently about it. We stay in it. So in other words, I, whenever I was reading this, I thought Nicodemus, he just, he, it just took him way out of, out of, out of context and way out of different thinking. And that's kind of what Jesus does. He does that with us, like, especially with forgiveness. If we look at our lives and we see, um, if, we, if we're holding on to, to unforgiveness, we're allowing that to, to take over our thoughts and our mind, right? Um, I read this book and it was absolutely great. So if you struggle with unforgiveness, um, y'all, this, is, this was a game changer in my life. Um, it was called I Should Forgive But, and I will put the link in um, after Bible study is over. But this book changed my life because what happened is, is I really held on to that bitterness and anger for a lot of years. And I think, I think with Nicodemus, I was just confused on how God could allow these things to happen. How could he have done this? I believed in him. I trusted in him. And he still allowed these things to happen. And, um, and it was like, how could these people do this to me? And so, see, my focus was on me. <laughs> first, first problem, which it usually is because I'm selfish, y'all. And the second problem is, is um, I, I really, I, I held on to so much, it hurt my relationship with others. And here's, here's the problem with that. Um, if you show grace the way Jesus shows grace, which we're going to really talk about that throughout John, um, God has given us grace, right? He's forgiven us of our sins. And so why can't we, we forgive others who have done that to us? And um, J.D. Greer, one of the pastors that I listened to, he said, um, there's two ways with unforgiveness that you can, you can look at, or forgiveness that you can look at. You can, one, uh, our kind of bitterness, I think he was talking about. He said, one, you can, you can forgive them. And you can hand them to the Lord and you can say, they're forgiven. I've been forgiven of much. And so I'm going to forgive them. Or you can try to hold on to that bitterness. Or And in, in whenever you forgive them and you give them to the Lord, then God's going to have his way with them. And so don't you think God can deal with them a whole lot better than you can? And the thing about that is if you hold on to that, that's only hurting yourself. And it's only hurting your relationship with Jesus. So is it really good to hold on to that? I don't, I don't think so. And, but it took me years, y'all, learn from my mistakes, because I have enough of them for all of us. Um, but really learn from this. The book, I Should Forgive But, it's a very old book, um, and the cover is really cheesy, y'all. I do not know what they were thinking, but it was written a while back. Um, but in it, he says, whenever you have, um, whenever, like, is, whenever you're, like, people who have been abused as children or just been done wrong so bad, and we just hold on and harbor to that bitterness, and it defines us, Right. Well, what we can do is we can put that person in Jesus jail. I really love this analogy, y'all. I love it, love it, love it. And so what we're saying is, okay, Lord, he, they are yours. They are in Jesus jail. And as they're in Jesus jail, only God can deal with them, right? You have put them there. They, You can walk away and they're, they're you're done. And so <laughs> I have literally done that with my thoughts. And um, if somebody does something against me or something, I'm like, you know what? They're in Jesus jail. I don't have to worry about it. It is freeing y'all free and you can pay lots of money for counseling but that was free um and that was the, the the gist of the book that i read and it was just really good um so if y'all if y'all really struggle with that just put them there and like wouldn't you rather jesus deal with them than mine he says vengeance is mine declares the lord so why do you think your vengeance is better than his and honestly i want the people to repent and come to know the lord kind of sometimes i don't honestly i'm, I'm just gonna be honest and really y'all at the time, sometimes I'm just like, you know what, right now I need to harbor onto my bitterness and I don't care. But then whenever God shows me what much of a sinner I am and how I needed him, I can start praying for their salvation too and see that they need Jesus just as much as I need Jesus. And, but they're in Jesus jail and as they're in Jesus jail, hopefully God would deal with them and their hearts and their minds and everything. So I don't know. That was, that was just, I don't know what, why I went into that y'all, but that's just, but that was free, I guess. <laughs> um, and so Jesus may have been returning to the, or verse 10. Sorry, y'all. I'm just totally going off a little on that one. Um, so are you a teacher of Israel and don't know these things? Jesus replied. So here, Jesus may have been returning the compliment from verse 2, whenever Nicodemus um, complimented Jesus. Jesus chided Nicodemus for not being aware of the need and the promise of the new birth because they were plainly laid out in the Old Testament. Nicodemus knew these passages well, but believed that they had been fulfilled in regard to the new birth. Um, he should have known better. If I told you earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? 
a simple look at earthly things like the illustration Jesus used and even a look at his own life should have made the point plain to Nicodemus. If he could not see that he needed this spiritual transformation, what more could Jesus tell him? And so we're going to go more into that, but that is huge. So Jesus, like, he's like, you know, he's already, he's not done nearly as much as he's already done or like that he's going to do. And we're going to see more of Nicodemus later in the chapters. And I really honestly believe that Nicodemus became a believer. So, um, but right now I think Nicodemus is just really, I mean, like it's everything that he's known his whole life. So think if you were born in a atheist home and everything you've known has been hate Jesus. And then like, or even like in other homes and stuff where that's just what you're told to believe in. And then it's game changer. You're like, Oh my gosh, like Jesus is real and everything. That's such a game changer, isn't it? And so that's what they're, he's telling, like he's telling Nicodemus, everything you've believed, everything you've known, everything you've learned your whole life. And I'm, I'm turning that upside down. Um, and Jesus has a way of doing that in our lives, y'all. <laughs> No one has ascended to heaven, but he who came down from heaven. Jesus makes it clear that he can speak authoritatively about things in heaven, though no one else can. In short, we have here the basis in Christ's own words of the statement in the prologue that the word was in the beginning with God and became flesh, be a light to men. We talked about that in chapter one. So if y'all did miss chapter one, make sure you go back because that was huge. That chapter one is so vital for the whole book or actually the whole Bible. It's just title. Um, oh, Kathy, you have put people in Jesus' jail. Didn't know what you call it. Yeah, so now you know. Like, you can just say, they're in Jesus' jail. We're good. So, I love it. I love it. That's what, I, yeah, it's a game changer. Um, so let's see here. In short, okay. No one has ascended to heaven. This seems like a figurative expression for no man hath known the mysteries of the kingdom of God, as in Deuteronomy thirty twelve. And then Psalm 73, 17, Proverbs 34, 30, verse 4, um, Romans 11, verse 34. And the expression is founded upon this generally received maxim that to be perfectly acquainted with the concerns of a place, it is necessary for a person to be on the spot. So this is so cool, y'all. This is I'm so excited about this. This is probably my, my excitement, my nugget for this, because I love how the Bible backs up with the Bible with itself. But if you go to Proverbs, this is so cool. Go to Proverbs chapter 30, verse 4. It says, Who has gone up to heaven and come down? Who has gathered the wind in his hands? Who has bound up the waters in a cloak? Who has established all the ends of the earth? What is his name and what is the name of his son? If you know, there you have it. Like, seriously, Proverbs chapter 30 talks about Jesus. Like scripture backing up a scripture prophesying. Do you know that that's what he's saying? Do you know? Oh my goodness, we know it's Jesus. Like, how cool is that? Like, I love that. I absolutely loved it. That was like my favorite thing. I was just like, see, there you have it. If I t if I do anything with these scriptures, it's that verse that backs up with that, and it's just so cool because we we know. So as we read Proverbs, we're like, we're so many thousand years after that was written, and we know, we know. So it's just so exciting how scripture does that. Okay, we're going to finish up with um, verses 14 through 15. And it says, Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, so that everyone who believes in him will have eternal life. And y'all, this is cool too. This is my other second favorite thing. <laughs> Sorry, y'all. Sorry. This was like, I got so giddy yesterday after reading this that I couldn't like, you know how sometimes you just get so like energized by reading scripture? This energized me like the lore. So if you see how he said this, if you go, let's see, verse 30, uh, 30 notes from, if we go to Numbers 21, so that's what he's talking about here. So we have to go to Numbers 21. Oh, this is so exciting, y'all. This is so exciting. 21, 4 through, 4 through 9. So, they set out from the Mount uh, Or um, by way of the Red Sea to bypass the land of Edom, but the people became impatient because of the journey. The people spoke against God and Moses. Why have you led us up from Egypt to die in the wilderness? There is no bread or water, and we detest this wretched food. Then the Lord sent poisonous snakes among the people, and they bit them so that many Israelites died. 
the people then came to Moses and said, we have sinned by speaking against the Lord and against you. Intercede with the Lord so that he will take the snakes away from us. And Moses interceded for the people. Then the, then the Lord said to Moses, make a snake image and mount it on a pole. When anyone who is bitten looks at it, he will recover. So Moses made a bronze snake and mounted it on a pole. Whenever someone was bitten, he looked at the bronze snake, he recovered. This is a cool thing because that is such an example of Christ on the cross. So how exciting is that? So as we read that, we can see that. Um, this is probably my last day doing Bible study outside because I'm sweating like crazy, y'all. Um, Moses' serpent in Numbers 21 was made of bronze, and bronze is a metal associated with judgment in the Bible. Because bronze is with fire, a picture of judgment. We would have wanted to diminish our sense of sin and put the image of a man up on the pole. Our image of man might represent both good and bad in a man. But a serpent is more appar apparently sinful and shows us our true nature and true need of salvation. So in the Numbers 21, 4 through 9 account, the people were saved not by doing anything, but by simply looking at the bronze serpent. They had to trust that something as seemingly foolish as looking at such a thing would be sufficient to save them. And surely some perished because they thought it too foolish to do such a thing. Nicodemus had failed to grasp the teaching about the new birth when it was presented to him in terms drawn from Ezekiel's prophecy. Now it is presented to him by means of an object lesson from a story from which he had been familiar since childhood. Remember, he had to know these scriptures. He had to memorize the first five books of the Bible. And y'all, numbers is kind of hard. And, um, you know, but he did. He memorized them. And so he knew this and he knew what Jesus was saying. This is a term later used to describe the both Jesus' cru crucifixion, and that's John 12, 32, which we'll get into probably a long time from now, and his ascension, and that's Acts 2, 33. Both meanings are in view, his suffering and exaltation. Jesus was lifted up in both ways. As it says in Isaiah 45, 22, look to me and be saved, all you ends of the earth, for I am God and there is no other. We might be willing to do a hundred things to earn our salvation, but God commands us to do only trust in him, to look to him. Um, and Nicodemus had failed to grasp that teaching about the new birth when it was presented to him in terms drawn from Ezekiel's prophecy. Now it's presented to him by cool, by means of object lessons from a story with which he had been familiar since childhood. So that, again, I had mentioned that earlier. We will see more of Nicodemus throughout John, but I hope y'all are listening. If you do not, and especially if you don't have a relationship with Jesus and try not to be like Nicodemus here and walk away not seeing the true God. Now, eventually, I feel like Nicodemus does, and later on, um, we'll talk about that. But um, as of right now, Nicodemus didn't believe, so he talked to Jesus. Jesus explained all of this to him, and yet he still walked away not believing. Y'all have that opportunity now to really believe in the Lord um, if you don't have a relationship with him. And um, again, I always say, PM me if you have any questions. Um, and so I would definitely say, um, you know, this, again, Jesus all the way in numbers, again, scripture is backing up with Jesus. That's another prophecy of Jesus. Because um, whenever, especially, oh, y'all, whenever me and my husband studied that scripture, it was so cool just by seeing a Moses in the cert, like just that whole depiction of the cross and how we have to look at the cross. We have to look to the cross. Um, I am a kindergarten teacher at a small Christian school. I teach the story to my class and they get it. As Jesus said, have faith and just look at the serpent. Yes, Kathy. I think you hit it. Faith like a child. We don't have to figure it out. Here Nicodemus is trying to pick it apart and figure it out and have to know. But sometimes we have to trust and then the knowledge comes. And y'all, it takes years and years. And we're never going to be like fully there until we are in glory with Jesus in heaven. So I hope you have a relationship with the Lord. So if you, if something happens, you will be with the Lord. Um, so I, I am just really excited. Um, this this excites me. And then we get to start with John 3, 16 next week, which I'm sure I'm excited to see what God has in store for that and what he um, reveals, because this was cool, because two scriptures backing up with scripture is so, I mean, like so dead on. But then you have all of the Ezekiel and the Isaiah and all of that is backing up scripture with scripture, saying Jesus is the Messiah. So if you have any questions, please let me know. Thank you all so much for joining me. I am humbled at the fact that y'all are here and um, that you listen and you're so patient with me. If you have any questions, please feel free to, um, I check throughout um, the week as I, as I do this and I will pin it to the top. And again, make sure you check next week 
um, on when I'm going to teach because I'll probably switch to at night um, just because it'll probably be easier with the little one here and everything. So I hope you'll have a fabulous week. Make sure you look up those scriptures and just dig into God's word. It's such a, it's so amazing. So y'all, thank you. I, I am, thank y'all. I, you have no idea. I know you, I mean, I just am humbled at the fact that y'all again, that y'all um, are here and listen and everything. Have a great week and enjoy your little ones if they're out of school this week.